All right, um, let's get started. It's just more appropriate that straight after the Drupal security panel, we talk about more in-depth security and uh, having to look at uh, securing your Drupal ecosystem with essential aid scanning. Um, OK, so um, this is more because it's in the development stream. I took more like a hands-on development approach. And uh, yeah, just a little bit intro about myself. Um, I've traveled 6,000 Ks to get here from Perth, um, but I'm actually in Melbourne. Uh, currently working as an enterprise architect uh, for an IoT multi-cloud um, uh, uh, company, and I'm um, a tech lead at uh, Hide and Seek Digital. I've um, been working with Drupal uh, for about 13 years or so, and uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, so a couple of topics of discussion. So I will start with a horror story um, of Log4j 2021, just to get us started. And uh, I'm going to... Yeah, kind of explain how Log4j has um, uh, shaken the government and has then um, gotten us to a point where everything started to, like, re required to be audited. Uh, all of a sudden, things and frameworks that were in place that were silent or ignored or not looked at started to be scrutinized, and we started getting huge um, emails, 40-page uh, papers to explain are we compliant, are we not compliant, and especially federal government, state government became uh, very difficult. Even though Log4j is not actually a simple thing, uh, every ecosystem became uh, very um, scrutinized. So we'll talk about um, what's the worst that can happen if you don't do security. Um, we'll look at what essential aid framework is, um, which is, yep, and then we also talk about different strategies and uh, approaches to become compliant with uh, Australian cybersecurity uh, essential aid framework. Uh, we'll talk about uh, lots of different types of mistakes that I've done over my career and, and I've seen other people do. And uh, yeah, we'll discuss the caveats of those mistakes and uh, we'll look at different um, ways that we can also protect Drupal websites from uh, attacks and um, uh, we're also looking at uh, different approaches and solutions to scanning uh, dependencies and scanning the ecosystem as a whole to make sure that we're compliant. Uh, from my point of view, um, I feel that uh, as these essential aid um, requirements started to be enforced, we found out really quickly that some of the tools are not in the market. There's actually no tools, no solutions that exist currently that provide end-to-end -end, uh, compliance kind of, um, uh, for Drupal. Uh, we'll look at uh, composer dependency scanning, reporting. We're looking at updating modules on time, how to do that. And we'll also look at different weaknesses um, of uh, platforms, um, looking at self-hosted, commercial, enterprise types of hosting, and um, how you can shoot yourself in the foot by picking the wrong uh, host. Um, we'll summary and Q&A. The topic is huge. Uh, the topic is vast. Uh, I was just saying it's like a degree in itself. Um, cybersecurity. So, um, yeah, I won't have all the answers for you, but at least hopefully we'll get into the right direction. So, uh, we'll start with a horror story. Uh, at the time, December 2021, I was working for a federal, federal government client in Australia, a Fair Work Commission, and uh, we've delivered a large website with 30 um, progressively decoupled applications inside it, and everything was going really well until um, the government got hit really, really badly with Log4j. What happened is, uh, yes, yeah, so um, over 80% um, of ecosystem has um, been affected. And uh, as you can see here, a very famous meme, uh, you have a modern and fancy ecosystem sitting there. And the log4j is just a tiny little dependency down there at the bottom, uh, which allowed uh, basically uh, full admin access to all the servers, allowed you to download the database, allowed you to drop the database, allowed you to access basically uh, environment variables just by running a couple of commands in the terminal. Um, I've joined some meetings, a lot, a lot of meetings. Um, and uh, uh, some of the interesting comments from those meetings were, um, we've got a phone call from Canberra, a really, really high place, and we're screwed. Uh, we need to shut everything down, right? Um, do we even have Log4j? What is Log4j? If we have Log4j, what version Log4j? Uh, what version is vulnerable? Um, if we update it, is it going to crash? Do we have a dev environment where we can test it? Oh, we don't. Um, I had some of the, this server's been running fine for 11 years. I don't know what will happen if I'm going to update it. 
and this is we're talking federal government, right? Uh, yeah, uh, let's see. Some of the IT technicians were going, we'll just update Windows by clicking the update button, going to sleep, and the next day everything's updated. So we don't know whether we've solved the problem or not, whether this particular module has or has not been updated. Um, yeah, so some of these questions in those meetings, we found out that the government was really not ready, or at least a lot of the clients that we were servicing were completely not ready for this type of scrutiny. So even though uh, Essential 8 and so many other frameworks that we just discussed in the earlier talk were available, uh, they were not used, they were not implemented, they were ignored. Um, so um, I'm going to go into the red screen of death now. Anyone um, seen this before? Uh, has anyone have to deal with this on their own project or their own site? You can raise your hand. Yeah, there's a few hands. Yeah, so this is basically the worst thing that can happen to your site. By the time you get this red screen of death um, sponsored by Google Chrome, uh, your website has been delisted from Google. It's off Facebook. It's the Google ad campaign has been stopped. Uh, all of your tra paid traffic is terminated and your reputation on Google will never be the same. Also, everyone is going to get this red screen of death in their browser. Uh, yeah, so it indicates that your website already has malware, it's infecting clients. Uh, the website might have scripts that will be stealing your data. Uh, yeah, uh, you will have complete loss of reputation, significant drop in Google rankings, and you will need to clean your website up. Uh, seen this several times and when I went in uh, I saw some of this uh, magic in the PHP code. Uh, this is actually a file from WordPress but um, anyone can see any issue with this uh, PHP file here? Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's right. Sorry, it is a WordPress but uh, the concept is the same. Um, as you can see uh, it, has, it has all the correct information plus a little bit extra lines of code. Um, now this is a base64 or whatever the method there is to encode uh, the you know injection or tr you know virus. Essentially, it uh, a very common pattern is the website gets injected. It then gets um, uh, all the PHP files receive a nice little injection like that. It's really difficult to decode it. You don't know what it does, uh, but essentially it will then um, um, result in the red screen of death. Um, manual cleanup is really difficult and costly. Nowadays, not so important with the enterprise um, cloud hosting platforms uh, existing that don't allow to write to file system, but this is very much still the case for, um, uh, you know, self-hosted, I can do it myself, or, or um, low kind of um, GoDaddy, you know, net registry, those uh, really cheap Bluehost um, uh, servers. Okay, so um, uh, when, uh, the log4j happened, I was asked, um, is today's build secure? Are today's dependencies secure? When was the last time we ran the build and have all the dependencies have been compiled as part of the composer? Are they all secure? Is there log4j? If yes, what version? We need to know. We need to know every day as part of the compliance. But uh, we could not answer those questions. And then after digging, there wasn't a module or anything that actually existed to be able to do that level of reporting which was required for the essential aid compliance. So, um, yeah, um, exactly. Are you 100% certain all the dependencies are secure? Uh, can there be a report? There was no report. We had to build that solution. Uh, so, going to go through what actually is essential aid. I did not know until um, 2021, but I found out very quickly being a a delivery lead, a technical lead, Drupal lead on this project. Uh, Australian Essential 8 uh, is a framework developed by Australian Cybersecurity Centre, uh, essentially help organisation assess and improve the cybersecurity practices. Uh, there are eight strategies, uh, but it has not been tailored for Linux or web applications. Essentially, it's very Windows-based. So some of those, I believe two out of the eight, are really not applicable because they're talking about Microsoft... Um, um, macros, um, which are, you know, it's not a Drupal thing, so. Um, yeah, so um, I didn't know that Australian Government um, Signals Directorate exists. I didn't know that Australian Cybersecurity Centre exists, but I found out uh, fairly quickly once I, I had to meet the compliance. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to go through individual um, uh, 
each individual strategy. Um, but of course, the topic is extremely extensive. Like uh, Michael Richardson mentioned in an earlier talk about the Drupal Security Panel, it's very um, comprehensive. There are documents that are 400 pages in length. There are multiple frameworks. So this is just to cover, uh, just to cover the surface and to get an understanding of uh, what compliance looks like. Essentially, I needed to complete a 40-page document for a federal government to tell them that we are compliant, this is how we're handling compliance, and uh, yeah. Uh, just to mention as well, um, some of the things are very straightforward, like can we do um, multi-factor authentication? Yes, we can. Can we do a daily report and, and vir antivirus scan? Hmm, maybe not. Uh, how do you do that on an enterprise platform, enterprise cloud platform? If you're self-hosted, do you have enough um, virtual machine, machine CPU to be able to execute those scanners? Unknown, unclear. And uh, at the end, um, some of the really obscure ones that I'm going to get into, and really ridiculous ones, like can we have um, MFA on a SSH connections? Mm -hmm. CICD needs to use two-factor authentication and things like that. So anyway, uh, we'll start with the application whitelisting. So strategy involves creating a list of approved software applications allowing those um, on the list to run. Uh, so whitelisting is the first one. Uh, patching is the second one. Um, we've got configure Microsoft Office macro settings, which is the third one, totally not applicable. Um, user application hardening, and uh, yes, so applicable or not. Um, we've got uh, restricting administration, administrative privileges, um, patching, everyone knows about that, and uh, Finally, the multi-factor authentication backups. Yeah, so essentially, uh, it's a model, it's a framework, it's a guideline that uh, as a developer you can get, and then you need to answer the questions in order to kind of understand whether or not you are compliant and not you, might, you need to take steps towards compliance more and more and more. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Drupal, can be exploited as, you know, if anyone still remembers the Drupal Geddon uh, story, um, zero day vulnerability. Uh, for me, I was working in a company uh, that, that happened at 7 p.m. and I think I was awake for 20 hours straight from 7 p.m. Uh, manually um, cleaning up the site. And uh, I'll go into that uh, topic in a second. Uh, we're going to talk about the bad architecture and how bad architecture can really and shoot you, shoot you in the foot. Uh, even you are, um, you know, compliant at the server level or ecosystem level. If the application or application architecture is not there, you will, you know, not be. Yeah, you can still have uh, really bad after effects of attacks. So yeah, I mean, we can exploit Drupal through cross-site scripting. Uh, SQL injections are very common when uh, you just put some SQL code into a, you know, contact form. Uh, uh, denial of service, a distributed denial of service, and uh, file inclusion vulnerabilities too. Um, this is the approach to protecting, right? So we've got the whitelisting, uh, the patching, restricting admin privileges, multi-factor uh, backups, and network segmentation, as recommended by the Central Aid. Um, if you translate this into the Drupal, the Drupal needs to be kept up to date. You need to secure your database, probably not have the database open uh, to the internet only open to the um, uh, instance that actually has the Drupal on it. Um, strong passwords, two-factor auth, um, using security models and scanning, um, make sure you restrict access, check your logs regularly, um, implement backup and recovery plan, and stay informed of security vulnerabilities. Uh, but it's not going to help you if you have bad architecture. So. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, I was working a full-time job about uh, seven years ago, and when I got to my um, company, I SSH'd into the server. The moment I got my key and I saw uh, this, uh, on the left here, I saw dev, a prod, and stage on one virtual machine. And I asked uh, the technical lead a question. I said, um... Why? And he said, cost. It's cheaper. We don't have to run three servers. And then he said, it's really good because if you run a shell script, you can copy the database from one instance to the other really quickly. So easy, right? 
no problem. And then there was an HD access file here on the right. You can see, um, uh, depending on the, which URL was hit, it would redirect uh, the, the traffic to that particular folder inside a cPanel uh, server, which was a uh, self-hosted VM. Sounds like a perfect architecture. Uh, so what happened is um, there was also a backups folder. I forgot to show that. And all the backups were also put in the folder. After three months of working at that job, I tried to change it. But I said, no, don't, 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 don't touch it. It's okay. So when the Drupal get in happened, the whole backup was deleted. Ev and when I did a scan, we had 500 files infected out of 4,000 uh, in both staging, dev, and production. Uh, no backups. So I had to do manual cleanup. Uh, so I'll get into manual cleanup in, in, a, in a minute. Now, you'd think that now with the more modern enterprise-grade uh, platforms like, you know, Acquia, Ironstar, you know, Platform Sage, um, Pantheon, it's no longer the same. So you probably no need to worry that much about this. But still, if you're self-hosting, if you are, um, you know, using cPanel, if you're using Plesk, if you are running a smaller site, and uh, you, this is very normal. Um, so... Um, yeah, no matter how you are, if you are architect badly, it's not going to help you. Um, you know, there's uh, also another level of vulnerabilities that's really difficult to pick up. Like when we're talking about the hosting, yeah, your hosting can be secure. Uh, you can have all sorts of security monitoring in place, but if you write bad code, like for example here, um, anyone see any issue with um, any lines um, here? Looks, it's very optimized, you know. You. you uh, that's it. Um, so, um, see, like, you got something like that. Uh, even you have the best enterprise grade platform, load balanced, and multiple regions, uh, you're screwed. So, here, of course, uh, you need to use proper Drupal database API and, and you know, you just sanitize the input before you are, um, you know, um, pushing this to prod. But I've seen this before in production and, uh, yeah, so that's another thing, right? So um, as we talk a bit more about the remediation strategies, remediation approaches, we need to search for this and report on that daily. We need to also report and search on, um, you know, look up whether all the composer dependencies and dependencies of the dependencies are all up to date and also not vulnerable, don't contain zero day vulnerabilities. Um, um, yeah, that's explanation of what we should be doing and what you could expect in terms of um, um, you know exploit in the second in the second black box there uh, Drupal get and two um, yeah so Drupal get and two uh, uh, really kind of um, I, I was showing previously an exploit I don't have time to show an exploit here but it just uh, show you how easy it is when their vulnerability happens, an exploit um, is published normally, and then you can reverse engineer it or just, uh, you know, use that to literally gain production access to any website. And this is kind of an example of what happened with Log4j as well. Uh, there was um, a zero day vulnerability, there was a big disclosure in a patch, people reverse engineered the patch, and in the next two, three days, uh, there were exploits available on the internet to be downloaded and just ran it or run it on your system to gain production access to any site. But then we, because of lack of scanning, because of lack of awareness, they weren't patched, uh, which resulted in major, major breaches across different um, uh, systems. Um, see, um, yeah, so this was a um, Python script I was writing to showcase the, um, um, the exploit. Yeah, um, scanning and reporting is really important. So as part of the Essential 8, you need to scan and give a report daily. Uh, and this is the part that I found was really difficult because uh, it just did not exist uh, in, in the market. Or maybe you could run a, compo you can run a composer thing uh, to, do, to do the scan, to do the reporting. However, um, it was not automated. It did not result in the correct report. So I made a module um, which I've open sourced. Uh, and just an example of why this um, uh, composer dependency scanning is required. See, so here's, uh, we've got a composer file here, right? And it looks okay, but if you're running a build every, 
you know, every time you do a production deployment, there is a little problem here, right? Anyone can see how this could be vulnerable? Yeah, that's it. Um, there is a... Uh, we've locked one of them. I can't remember which one. But because we've locked it, that means that every time you're going to build it, it's going to stay at the same version. So even if it's vulnerable, you're going to compile that. You're going you're gonna to compose or install that. And then that could be used to gain prod access and drop your database. So easy, so simple. And it's just two signs here. So something like that, we need to report on that. If this is done, we need to know, but there's no tools that currently exist to do that. Uh, sometimes GitHub would tell you, but providing you're using GitHub, what if you're using something else, right? Um, so I I'm, I'm made a little module here, which um, uh, you can check out if you like. Essentially what it does, um, so uh, what uh, my strategy was to really quickly solve this scanning for composer dependencies was to create a module which would expose securely compose a log file, uh, updates uh, required, modules that have expired and modules that have vulnerabilities from the Drupal, and then use a CI CD pipeline to consume that, um, which will allow them to run a whole bunch of scans. And you can use publicly available tools in the CI CD space, like, which we, we used Azure DevOps for that. Um, this, uh, Azure DevOps would consume those files, uh, will consume the output of the module, and um, you know, um, uh, yeah, run the scans and then output uh, output the report. You can then um, schedule the pipeline to run daily or even like twice twice a day, once an hour if you like. And you're going to get a report once an hour. I have not seen this solution anywhere else, so I ended up uh, building it. Uh, yeah, um, just a couple of tools because I think we're running out of time. Uh, I've found that once you've been attacked, uh, this is a really good antivirus. It's a um, uh, LAMP stack antivirus that works on any PHP application, but also works on WordPress and Drupal. You can install it. It's going to do a scan. It's going to give you a report. It costs about $6 a month. Um, it also does something called the heuristic logic scanning, which means that if it looks like a virus, for example, it's got a very long base 64 string, it might not exactly match any virus signature that exists at the moment in SVEs, but if uh, it matches it, it's going to give it to you in the report. It does file change monitoring, and it does that reporting daily. So very useful, very cheap. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, wanted to talk a little bit about the Cloudflare that we've mentioned in the Drupal security panel as well. I believe Aqua is using Cloudflare quite uh, heavily. Uh, Cloudflare is amazing. It has an AI-based uh, web application firewall that literally looks at deep packets and look at uh, using AI, analyzes the traffic. If it matches a pattern of a vulnerability, it's going to block that request and send it to a big black hole uh, without impacting your uh, you know, Drupal instance completely. So it does that at the edge level. And uh, the cost of this, um, you know, enterprise plan is expensive, but if you wanted to protect your own site or a small project, it's about 20, 25 US dollars a month. And uh, that literally will catch any, um, uh, you know, packets that match a uh, bad signature and is go it is going to stop it. Very, very good. And uh, saves a lot of time. Kind of like an instant, um, instant fix, really. Um, yeah, you can see here at uh, the dashboard, uh, you can see unique visitors and, uh, you know, you can see all the traffic that it's saved. But uh, it, stops C uh, it stops DDoS attacks and also has that AI-based uh, um, you know, um, attack detection, if you like. Um, yeah, so I've talked about the heuristic logic, uh, talked about the antivirus solutions. Uh, the reporting and scanning, uh, I figured it should be done using a pipeline, not to load the Drupal instance itself. It also might be that um, you might need to change the pipeline. So, um, sorry, you might need to change the code of the scanner. So I, I find that it's running as part of the CI CD, whether it's Circle CI or Azure DevOps, is really nice. The module that I've built um, exposes securely the log file and the JSON file, and then gives you like a token that you need to use to make an API call to that module. It, that you can w get that from the pipeline. You'll get the composer file. You can run the scanner on it, and then get your um, uh, get your um, results. Uh, this is one of the example. You can run a security checker like this, and it's going to yeah, it's going to give you. Uh, your report, and then you can just send an email or, you know, put it into JIRA or whatever you like to do. Um, got very little time left, so I'm just going to talk about uh, hosting. 
Um, see, self-hosting um, is the most dangerous one of all. Uh, people are smiling. It's true. Um, because uh, you need to maintain so many levels um, of dependencies and you're not getting that protection that was talked about in the previous talk here. Uh, Tenable is really great for Linux package scanning. Uh, it's an agent that's self-hosted, um, essentially uh, meets the government requirements because it's not sending data somewhere else to for analysis. Instead, it's installed on the agent, it runs on your local VM and gives you the report securely. However, uh, it will be tricky to install it on, because it's a, you need root access to Linux, uh, it's quite tricky to install it on the managed services. So that's, um, that's a caveat there. Um, yep. Um, so I think um, talked about most things. Uh, huge topic. Uh, needs to be scanned, needs to be mitigated, uh, and needs to be discussed further. Essentially, it's just one of the frameworks. There's multiple frameworks available. Um, yeah, so CDNs are great, handling vulnerabilities at the edge are really good. Um, you need to do antivirus scanning um, and you need to do reporting. Um, yep, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you found it useful. Uh, howdy, thanks for the talk. Um, so with the, um, the real-time scanning that you need to do, like for the static code analysis, mm. or um, how do you do that like in a containerized solution? Is there, does it apply or what do you do there? Yeah, so real time, it's, it doesn't have to be real time, but I, say, I guess th there's a few things, right? It could be a module that needs to be updated. It could be a custom module that has vulnerable code. It could be something weird that you're pushing upstream just now, quick fix, and that actually might make your website vulnerable. So, okay, so let's say if you are pushing it to Git, you can run a CI CD pipeline on pull request that is going to execute the security checker and then gonna send you the report. Looks good, or hey, this looks, doesn't look good. Um, so uh, that's normally the approach. I mean, of course, you can run it locally as well to get your report to see if you wrote something strange or if that's gonna pass. Um, when you, uh, before you deploy to production, CI CD pipeline could run and also give you the report. Then you can r scan production every day, which is the government requirement. They want a daily scan, they wanted a deep scan and get you the report. So just in case, for example, you push something today and tomorrow there's a zero day vulnerability that gets discovered and you've targeted that without knowing. So maybe it passed yesterday, but today it doesn't pass, right? So then uh, you want to know about it. So that's why we should do the production scans daily as well. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, you can catch me around if you wanted to ask any more questions. Thank you. <laughs>